welcome back to the Hitchhiker's Guide to Condensed Matter and Statistical Physics. So dedicated to machine learning in condensed matter. So this is our third day. And today we dedicated to uh, machine learning, many body quantum physics. So today the main lecture will be by Giuseppe Carleo uh, from EPFL later on. But before we start with basic notions, so follow you and uh, basic notions will be given by Filippo Vicentini who is a collaborator, young collaborator of uh, Giuseppe Carleo and also from EPFL. So um, as usual, you will ask uh, questions, in, uh, you'll put questions in the question and answer box and we'll try to answer all of them during the lecture. So I give the word to Filippo and enjoy today's lectures, everyone. So Filippo, please. Thank you, Asia. Uh, let's see. Okay. so. Thanks everyone for for the occasion, uh, for the opportunity of being here, giving this introductory lecture to machine learning for many body quantum physics. Um, the, you know very well uh, what's the format of today's lecture. So now I will be giving this introduction. I will mainly cover two topics. So uh, what are neural quantum states and how we can use neural networks to encode the information of quantum states and to represent them and then uh, how we can uh, use this tool to solve uh, some interesting problems in, um, in quantum mechanics, such as finding the ground state or performing the time evolution. While this afternoon, like while soon after this introduction, Giuseppe will be giving a talk on uh, a seminar on uh, exciting new developments in the field. So yes. So the talk is divided into two parts. Uh, this first part is more about uh, uh, narrow quantum states, while the latter on uh, the problems we are trying to solve. And I will take some questions uh, in the break between the two parts and then at the end. So I think that I don't really need to motivate anyone, any of you about um, about why we are interested in, in, in quantum physics and why we want to study what systems, I mean, uh, you all know how exciting it is. Our, uh, the developments are nowadays on quantum computing, on uh, experiments on high temperature superconductivity. There are experiments and uh, there are theories studying how uh, chlorophyll and the mechanism to convert uh, photonic energy into, uh, into chemical energy uh, work by using quantum physics. So, Behind all those problems, all those fields, uh, we have a framework of quantum quantum physics that try that we use to describe those those systems. And of course, the most important uh, thing, the most fundamental part of uh, quantum physics, maybe relies on the fact uh, that uh, we want to describe those states. So I'm sure you know it very well already. Um, when we try to describe the quantum systems and the state of this, uh, we have. Uh, uh, we have a problem we, because this is very complicated. Uh, this is very complicated. So imagine we take, uh, I don't know, a, a system composed of spins. So particles that are either down or up. So it's, binary, it's a binary state, zero or one, and consider a system made of uh, n different spins. So if, if I just was to describe such a classical system with a classical state, then I would need to describe the state of every single particle composing the system individually. So I want one bit of information for the first spin. It can either be down or up, so I need one bit. The second particle is also described by one bit and the third and so on. So if I have n particles, I need uh, n bits of information. And therefore, if I increase the size of my system, I will need uh, uh, the same number of bits of information. And therefore, it's relatively easy to store on computer uh, in the memory of my computer, millions and billions of, uh, of particles, state of us, because uh, I mean, the growth is the growth in the memory requirement is linear. Instead, uh, in quantum physics, so if I want to describe this as a quantum system and its quantum state, I need to serve a wave function, which you know very well is basically a complex number associated with every possible configuration. So I need to store a complex number corresponding to the up, up, up configuration, to the up, up, down configuration, and so on and so forth. And this complex number is somehow a probability distribution with some information about the phase. 
And the problem is that the number of possible combination increases exponentially with the number of particles in my system. And therefore the memory requirements of storing the wave function increases exponentially too. And this is a, a problem because nowadays on my laptop, I can store around a bit more than 30 particles, I think, but then I would need to soon use a cluster or a supercomputer and there is no way, there is no supercomputer on earth that can store more than I think 50 or 60, 50 part, the state of 50 spins, for example. And, and I doubt that in the next years, we will be able to solve this issue uh, just by technological uh, innovation because this, this increase is exponential. Every time we add another spin, uh, every time we add another qubit, we need to double the, the, the amount of memory we need. So this is just a formal uh, description of what is going on here. Essentially, uh, the wave function can be written as this uh, psi, uh, this wave vector. Uh, and, and basically, I need to store one combination, one, one complex number for every possible element in the basis. And in this case, I chose as a basis the up, down uh, basis for every spin. And this is the same thing. So when I do this, uh, what I'm doing essentially is I'm, I'm describing, I, I can describe any possible wave function in, in the whole Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space contains many possible wave functions, all of them. And many of those are not interesting for, for what we are doing. So very often we are just interested in the ground state of the system. Uh, sometimes we are interested in highly correlated phases of matter because uh, we can we can build technological devices with them and so on and so forth. And most of the states that we are interested in have of structure to them. So they are either, uh, they respect some symmetries. So actually we need, there are fewer degrees of freedom within them. They, uh, they have some interesting correlations. And therefore I don't really care about describing all possible uh, all possible wave functions, but I only care about describing a subset of them that are physically relevant. And for one of the first proposals that was uh, that was brought forward uh, still at, at the beginning of quantum mechanics was that in general, I, I, I don't really care about describing the, like the whole uh, wave function and all its entries, but I could actually write it down, write with a wave function as, uh, as some function that instead of storing every possible entry of the all wave, the wave function, I, I just uh, store its dependency on some parameters. And those parameters should be fewer than the number of degrees of freedom of the Hilbert space. So essentially what is going on is that I have my, I have some parameters, hopefully fewer than, than the size of the Hilbert space. I feed them the wave function. So actually I feed them to a function, an arbitrary function. And then by doing this, I can actually compute every entry in my wave function. So of course, this is interesting if it can solve my memory problem that I, I talked about before. So essentially, if the size of, this, uh, of the space where those parameters live is polynomial in the size of my, uh, in the size of my system instead of exponential, then I kind of addressed this issue because now I only need a polynomial uh, amount of memory to store my state instead of an exponentially large amount of memory. At the same time, if I can do that, but to compute expectation values or any physically relevant quantity, I still need to perform this sum over the whole Hilbert space, then I didn't address my problem. I actually just hit it because I will still need to do an exponential number of operations on it. I still need to perform this sum on my computer. So actually there are two classes of uh, variational states, uh, variational in the sense that they depend on those variational parameters, this W. So there are computationally tractable states, which are states such as mean field, Goodswiller mean field or matrix product states, where I don't need to perform this whole sum of the Hilbert space, but I can recast it as, a, as some operation which is of polynomial complexity. For example, matrix product states re re like um, remap this sum over some product of matrices which have a polynomial size. Uh, mean field, for example, just uh, uh, doesn't sum on, on all the possible entries, but just on the whole local Hilbert space. And then you just perform a product and so on and so forth. However, in general, this function could be 
like something where we cannot, with, what, with which we cannot do that. So imagine this size a neural network or an arbitrary nonlinear function. Um, I can. It's not easy to recast this sum in something that we know to try how to treat exactly and in polynomial time. So this second class uh, might belong to computational efficient states. So for a variational ansatz, for a vari for a function to be uh, a, an efficient, a computationally efficient state, we need to uh, address two requirements. The first one is that it must be efficiently evaluable, which means that I can compute the wave function given the set of parameters and given a certain element of my basis in polynomial time. And this is generally true. If I have a polynomial number of parameters, uh, in general, the number of operations that I will need to do will also be polynomial. At the same time, I also need to be able to sample configurations from the square modulus of the wave function efficiently. And this is not so trivial because the probability distribution induced by it uh, is this function. And you might see that at the denominator here, I have the uh, norm of the wave function. So unless my answer uh, is normalized already, and therefore I know this entry, I will need to compute this sum over an exponentially large space. So I believe Giuseppe might mention later uh, some ansatzes, a class of ansatzes where this, uh, the denominator here is, is, is easy to compute, but in general it is not true. So we need more advanced techniques to do that. So if those two requirements are met, there is an interesting theorem, uh, and it's actually very trivial to prove, that, um, that it is possible to compute any expectation value of a k-local operator with polynomial accuracy in polynomial time. So k-local operator is a notion that comes from uh, um, information theory, which corresponds in terms uh, more in more physics term to uh, an operator that has at most uh, k-body interactions. So, Hamiltonians in like physical Hamiltonians and physical observables in general are k local because they only we only consider like one or two particles interaction. Think about the Ising Hamiltonian, we have two body interactions. Like in some cases, we have three or four body interactions, but usually they're just like there is a notion of locality in our models. So the proof of this is extremely simple. It just stems from the fact that if I start from the definition of uh, an expectation value, um, you and, and then I, I insert here the identity, I can just essentially can expand here on, on the whole Hilbert space. Um, and then if I divided both sides of this equation by psi applied to sigma, um, Essentially what I'm doing, I'm collecting here one term, actually this term, sorry, which uh, corresponds to a probability distribution. If you notice, essentially this term here, um, it's very simple to see that uh, P of sigma belongs in R, is a real number. It's positive because I took an absolute, a, a module square, and uh, it is in the inter interval between zero and one. And it's also normalized to one if I sum over the Hilbert space by definition. So you see that here I have a probability distribution and then I'm multiplying on the other side by this O lock. This is a, a local term. And I claim that we can compute this term in polynomial time. And this is because even if here you see this sum over eta, which, is, which means over the whole Hilbert space, so I would have two to the n elements in theory. In practice, uh, if my operator is, uh, is k-local, what happens is that I'm fixing a row, the row corresponding to the sigma entry in this big matrix. And then I'm looking at all the non-zero columns in this matrix. And if it's k-local, there are like most of, his, most of its entries are zeros. So there are only few, polynomially few, uh, non-zero entries. And therefore this has, polynomially few non-zeros. Uh, psi, we said that already, it's an hypothesis that we must be able to compute it efficiently in polynomial time. So we can compute those entries in polynomial time. Now, of course, I still have this sum here over the whole Hilbert space, but we can also address that. Uh, the reason for that is that um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you notice, uh, what they wrote here is a sum over some variable 
time of the probability of this of this of this item times a quantity. So this is exactly the definition of an expectation value or of a of a statistical average. So some people might write it with an with an e of O log. So if I'm able to to extract elements of the Hilbert space that that are distributed according to the probability p of sigma, I don't actually need to perform this whole sum. I can just average O log this local estimator over a smaller set of elements, hopefully polynomially few. So actually the question is, can I sample this efficiently? Because once I do, then I can compute the average with, I mean, it's with the, as a mean, and uh, the error will go down as, uh, as the inverse of the square root of the number of samples that I took. So of course, if I take infinitely many samples, my estimate would be exact and I can control this uh, I can control the, the accuracy with a number of samples. So the question is, how can I sample this efficiently? How can I sample the, the square modulus of a wave function efficiently? The problem is, as I said before, is that this denominator here, sorry, so this denominator here cannot be computed easily, at least in general. So there is a technique which uh, I believe uh, someone already mentioned before in, in last week lecture, I think, which is called Metropolis Hastings Monte Carlo, where if we can compute not the probability, the probability of, a, of an entry, but actually a function that is proportional to it. So in this case, just the nominator of the probability distribution, what I can do is then generate a chain of elements, a succession of elements, sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two, so on and so forth, that will be asymptotically distributed according to the probability distribution that I'm trying to sample. So, I may, so the algorithm is very simple. You start from an initial configuration, which you can generate however you want. Let's say you, you pick a configuration at random. Let's say, sorry, uh, let's say up, up, down, and then at every iteration, what you do is you, you propose, according to some rule, a new configuration. So let's say that my rule is um, I pick one of those pins and I flip it. So this is my sigma, let's say, zero. My sigma prime will be up, down, down. So I flipped the second spin. And now what I do is I compute the probability of corresponding to sigma zero, and I compute the probability corresponding to sigma prime. If the probability of sigma prime is greater than the probability of sigma zero, it means that I, won't, I went in, like, in, a, in a direction where there is more probability, and then I accept the new move, and I will repeat the algorithm starting from this new state. If instead the probability decreased, what I do is that I don't reject it outright, but I have some probability of rejecting it. I exponentially suppress the probability of accepting it. And if I do this many times, so if I repeat this operation, I will obtain a succession of states. And uh, let's say apart from the beginning where there is some correlation with initial state, whatever comes after will be distributed according to the probability I'm trying to sample from. Of course, I need a sufficiently large sample size. Of course, my transition, uh, my transition rule must respect some properties of my system. Um, but in general, this, will, uh, this method works uh, and is very powerful. So I don't want to get in the details of why it works. Uh, let me just say that it is derived from detail balance or microscopic, microscopic reversibility, which essentially is the idea that if I'm at, um, at equilibrium uh, and I have a certain distribution of, of the configurations of my system at equilibrium, then the probability to go from the probability to be in a state and to go from that state to another state must match the reverse, the probability of a reverse process. And by doing that, and, and the only uh, thing you must keep in mind is that you want to, um, if, you, if you define the probability to go from one state to another as, and you split it with the probability of proposing a move and then the probability of accepting it, you can actually derive this acceptance acceptance formula that was uh, that was proposed by metropolis in Athens back in the 70s 
So what this algorithm does essentially is that even if I cannot compute the full, pro even if I don't know the full probability distribution, but I can compute some, some let's say the denominator, so I can compute ratios. Since I'm computing a ratio here, uh, the, the, the normalization factor, which is constant, um, factors out and I don't need to know it anymore. This is very powerful. So imagine, for example, that I decide to use as a variational function a neural network. So what I can do, for example, is I can pick a very simple two-layer feedforward networks, a restricted Boltzmann machine, where I'm where the input of this machine is, I don't know, a bit string of up, up, down, which would correspond to one, one, zero, one, something like that. And then I multiply it by a, a matrix W, I add some bias, and then I pass it for a nonlinear activation function, usually log cosh, but you can use anything actually. Um, when you sum the output, um, what, what this is doing is, I mean, this is a neural network. And the reason why it is a good idea to, to use neural networks to do this, and we, sh we have shown there are several results nowadays in literature showing that it is a good idea to do this, it's because neural networks are very good at capturing um, correlations in your, in your system, at, ca at capturing um, some hidden correlation within whatever is the input that you're feeding. And therefore they can efficiently compress the information. And instead of you, of you needing to store this exponentially large state vector, the wave function, you can actually just store a few, I mean, still a lot, but much fewer parameters. So this W and this beta in this case. This function, as you can see, it's um, polynomially, it has a polynomial cost uh, to evaluate it. I mean, you, you just need the, uh, um, I mean, this is just a matrix vector product uh, and those matrices are, uh, have, let's say, have sizes of the order of square the number of, uh, of uh, spins in your system. Log cosh is a function that you apply linearly. So, I mean, it has some fixed costs for every entry. So this is, this can be, if, if this respects the first condition that we asked. And uh, I showed you that we can also sample from it uh, efficiently. So this, which we call neural quantum state. So using a neural network uh, to describe a variational quantum state actually satisfies all the requirements that we asked for. And that means that we can use it as a valid variational state. So with that, um, I, before moving on to the second part where I would be talking about uh, how we can use this technique to actually do some, to actually do something interesting and actually solve some problems I will start to take a few questions maybe. So let me check. Yeah, there are some questions in question and answer box. So you want to- Yeah, just a moment. Um, so could you again say, what do you mean by sampling? Um, so by sampling, I mean uh, that I, what I've shown is that I, I'm taking, I'm rewriting the operation of taking a, the expectation value of a quantum operator which traditionally involves a sum over the whole Hilbert space into a statistical average of a quantity, O log, which depends on the entries. And I'm averaging this, this quantity, you can think of it as a random quantity, uh, over some distribution. And this distribution is the square modulus of the wave function. So unless you can, so sampling means that I want to take configurations, elements from my Hilbert space. So configuration like, I don't know, uh, up, 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 down, up, down, up, down, configurations like that, according to their uh, probability. So imagine that uh, this, is my, this is my Hilbert space. So here I have up, 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 down. It's not working, sorry. So imagine I have, this is the direction of the Hilbert space. Uh, so here I have up, 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 down, down, up, and down, down. And here I have probability. So imagine that my distribution of probability is this, something like that. I don't know, I, just random numbers. I want to be able to extract, to have a set of, of configuration that, that 
that are distributed according, like approximately according to this distribution. And something means this, uh, extracting this set. Um, so this is classical Monte Carlo. Do you have any comments, ideas on quantum Monte Carlo? So the idea here is that this is classical sampling. So I'm uh, classically sampling from a distribution. Um, Uh, so in this metropolis algorithm, we assume no interaction. Um, I'm not sure what uh, what you what you're asking, uh, because now I'm just trying to sample from a distribution. So very, I'm this is simply a technique to sample a, a probability distribution. I'm not assuming an underlying model. I'm not assuming anything. I don't know if maybe you can, uh, we can unmute uh, Lavi Kumar. So maybe you can ask the question. Yeah. yeah. So Lavi, you can. Yeah. Hi, hi, Filippo. Th thanks a lot for this talk. So yeah, uh, so actually uh, my question was that these underlying spins, do they interact? So that was essentially the question when you were sampling them with the probability, which you actually explained very nicely how the sampling is going on. So I was saying these underlying spin chains, which you flip, do they have some kind of uh, this local interaction among them? Or it's just that we have like a distribution of these spins chains? So what I'm doing now is that um, I, I'm not talking about any model in particular. I'm mm. just saying that how would you go if you have a set of parameters for your variational state and, and compute expectation values. So in this, I, I'm not doing any assumption of, of what the model is. And the, the spin chain on which I'm doing the sample is actually, um, are actually configuration, like basis element of my Hilbert space. So I'm, I'm sampling basis elements. This is completely unrelated from the physical systems I'm studying. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, so another question, what is the difference between neural network and restricted Boltzmann machine? Right. So in a restricted, this is very simple, a restricted Boltzmann machine is just uh, one particular type of neural network. Like it's basically, um, I think it was already talked a lot about in the first um, uh, lectures you had in, in this uh, course uh, two weeks ago. So that's why I didn't really talk about it, but essentially this is a very simple neural network where this is the input layer this is the output layer, and I only have one intermediate uh, layer in between. The restricted Boltzmann machine is just a name for this particular kind of network. In general, you can add many more layers. You can add some very particular interactions to it. And uh, yeah. Um, by avoiding the exponential cost, are we losing any kind of information? OK. Um, Indeed, we are doing two things. Um, the first thing we are doing is that we are parametrizing the, uh, the Hilbert space with some function. And of course, this function is not able to represent, in principle, every possible wave function. It will only represent a subset of it. So yes, of course, I'm cutting away parts of the Hilbert space that I, in principle, do not care about. Uh, a way to see that are, for example, I don't know, the mean field ansatz. The mean field ansatz uh, um, cuts away any state that has quantum correlation between uh, different sites. Um, matrix product states bound those correlations. So neural networks uh, remove part of the Hilbert space in a much more contrived manner that we don't totally understand, but they are doing exactly the same thing. This is for, for the ansatz. Then for the sampling, what I'm doing is that I'm losing some information about the expectation value. So I don't know the exact value of the expectation value anymore. I only know a, an estimate with a certain error. So this is where I've hidden away the exponential complexity. Um, 
In neural quantum states, is the algorithm able to choose physically relevant Hilbert space by some means like probability? Uh, or do we provide it already with a wave function with variational parameters when it calculates the expectation? Um, okay, so what I was talking, again, what I was talking now is just about the, the neural quantum states in general. So it's just a, an efficient way like matrix product states or mean field to parameterize the Hilbert space. Um, in the next part of the lecture, I will be talking about um, how we can determine the parameters that give us the state that we're interested in. So how we can determine the parameters for the ground state and so on and so forth. So basically we have an optimization problem. Okay, so then does the cost of calculating the wave function drop if we consider only symmetric and anti-symmetric wave functions in case we had identical particle systems? Yes, indeed. So if, um, if you actually insert some information about the structure of your problem into your neural networks. So for example, imagine you want to describe a, a standard condensed matter system on a lattice and this uh, system has some point symmetry or translational symmetry. Then you can, for example, you can insert, you can actually see that the uh, translational invariance reduces the size of this W matrix in order to be, so that the output is invariant under translations and actually it reduces by a factor of n in 1D because you have n, uh, n possible symmetries now and therefore it does reduce the cost. So it's in general, it's a very good idea to use this information to reduce, uh, to further constrain uh, your, uh, your uh, neural network or your variational answers. What is meant with uh, polynomial accuracy? Uh, I mean that the accuracy depends polynomially on the, um, on the number of samples that I take. And therefore, if I have, uh, yeah, I have n samples, the accuracy goes down as one over square root of n, not exponentially. So for example, if you are near a phase transition and you want to determine uh, an observable with exponential accuracy, because this allows you to tell uh, in what phase you are in, for example, uh, I mean, you would need an exponentially large number of uh, parameters uh, of, uh, of samples. Okay, so, so is it sure that the neural network is taking advantage of the fact that samples in real world data sets actually live in a small subset of the Hilbert space, which we human cannot recognize? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so, so the whole Hilbert space is a space of, of wave functions, right? Uh, and the wave function is actually a space and the wave function is actually a vector uh, in, this, in this space. Um, so can, can you just, uh, Heyman Zhao, could you just, uh, can we unmute him and uh, maybe you can ask your question? Yes, Heyman, uh, you can ask the question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Uh, so, so what I mean is that those, uh, those samples, those data in the real world data sets uh, they actually, uh, for example, uh, all the data are like water molecules. They only live uh, in a small subset of the Hilbert space. So, so their wave function actually uh, is in a small subset. So, uh, but we cannot, uh, we, we don't know the correlation between those, uh, those molecules. So we don't know uh, what the actual subset is, uh, but neural network can help, uh, can help us capture those information. So, so, so it's actually in, implicitly fi finding the subset. So is, is, that, is that true? Um, okay, so with neural networks, it is hard to say exactly what part with neural quantum state, it, it is hard to know exactly what part of the Hilbert space we are parameterizing. So there are studies about it, but it's still hard to say exactly what what part of it we are parameterizing. But in general, what we are seeing is that uh, this parameterization does capture, uh, the, does, is able to describe physically relevant states. So- Okay, so, so that means, uh, that makes it uh, uh, more efficient to com compute, compute, right? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. So I'm just- uh, you have 25 more minutes. I'm not sure how much more of the Yeah, I just go on with the second part of the presentation and then in case I will finish answering the questions. Okay. So 
so in this uh, second part, I want uh, to address a bit uh, some, um, I want to talk about some problems that we can solve uh, with neural quantum states. So in general, we can think of, uh, I can think of two very broad class of problems. One of those is that, uh, um, like, one of those is when I want to determine, for example, the ground state, so the weights corresponding to the ground state of, uh, of uh, an Hamiltonian. So you give me an Hamiltonian, I need to find its ground state, or I need to determine the, the state uh, as, as evolved by this Hamiltonian, something like that. And the second uh, uh, category of problems is reconstructing a quantum state. So imagine you have an experiment, and you don't know exactly the state of your system when you do this experiment. You want to determine it. So what an experimentalist can do is he can do several measures, uh, local, like you know, local, whatever. But eventually, he has a set of measurements. He knows the basis on which he performs those measurements. And uh, he wants uh, to train a neural network in order to uh, describe, in order so that it, it, it describes the state of his system, but a priori doesn't know. So I think, I'm not sure that uh, Juan Carasquilla, we talk about this uh, second uh, application next week. Um, today, I will focus more on, on this, uh, on this uh, category of problems. So again, uh, what the, the first thing I want to talk about is determining the ground state. So you all know that uh, the ground state is the low, it's the eigen state of the Hamiltonian with the lowest energy. And so uh, the, uh, and so determining essentially what I want to do is uh, given a neural quantum state, so a state described by a certain neural network, you fix the architecture, let's say a restricted Boltzmann machine, now I want to find the, the parameters, the set of weight, WGS, that best approximates the ground state. So to do this, I want to recast the problem of finding the ground state into an optimization problem. And this, is, uh, this has been done a long time ago uh, by, by, with the formulation of a variational principle. Essentially, you can notice that the energy is an observable, so it's, uh, so it's real. It's, um, we know that the the, the state of all possible states in the Hilbert space with the lowest energy is the ground state. So that um, given any possible set of parameters W, the energy will be higher, greater or equal than the uh, ground state energy. So if I, found, if I find the set of parameter that gives me the ground state energy, then I know that I have found the ground state. And in general, then it's true that the lower the energy that a set of parameters gives me, the better is the approximation of the ground state. So in general, what we are doing is we want to find the set of weights that give me the minimum, the smallest energy. So this is really an optimization problem. And therefore, it can be addressed with either uh, global optimization techniques, where you evaluate the energy on every possible configuration, of, uh, on every possible set of parameters, and then you find the one with the lowest energy. Of course, since the space where parameters live is very highly dimensional, not exponentially large, but still it's, I mean, I can usually have two, three, four, five hundred dimensions, thousands of dimensions. Um, I cannot do this in general. So what we try to do is to, we use uh, iterative optimization techniques. Essentially, you start from an initial set of parameters. You just throw them at random, like you, or you have a, an educated guess about your initial parameters, W0. For those parameters, you can compute the energy. We know that this is efficient. Then we, co we compute the gradient of the energy for these uh, parameters. And we use this gradient to actually optimize, to, to correct uh, the parameters. So essentially, at every iteration, we take our parameters, we subtract the gradient, multiplied by some uh, speed or uh, learning rate, as we call it and the optimization rate, if you want. And then uh, that way we generate the new set of parameters and we do this on and on, so on and so forth. Now, it is interesting to notice that uh, you, can, you, could, you can think of this equation as delta W divided by some sort of discrete time delta T uh, is equal to minus eta, the gradient of W. Okay. So essentially what we are doing is uh, we are uh, solving some, some sort of uh, differential equation, discrete differential equation for the parameters W, and we are going down the potential well uh, induced by this energy. 
of course, the question, the first question you might have is, can we compute this gradient efficiently? Because I just told you that we can compute the energy, but not its gradient. So uh, this is quite easy to show. Essentially, I'll go back to what I showed you before. I was telling you that the energy uh, is an observable, no? So we can rewrite it as this sum over the whole Hilbert space of the probability of an entry times uh, a local estimator, this E log. Which, is, which can be computed efficiently because the Hamiltonian is, uh, has only at most one, two, or let's say few body interactions. Um, and then I can rewrite the expectation value of, en of the energy as this statistical average of this E log. Now, the gradient of the energy is then, uh, um, is then this vector where for every entry I have a derivative with respect to one parameter. So if you want, you can also think that these is basically d in the w1 of e w1 w2 etc w n uh, n parameters let's say right so this is just a different way of saying and so th those are just derivatives and in general uh, i think you've seen already the back propagation rule you know that we can there is a way to efficiently compute the, the gradient of uh, the neural network with respect to its inputs or its parameters by, by using this back, back, back propagation technique. And uh, it has roughly le le the same order, the same cost complexity as, the, as evaluating the neural network itself. So, I mean, so computing every entry of this vector, it uh, can be done efficiently. And in particular, you can show by doing some algebra that it's not complicated, but would just take some time. But the gradient can also be written as an expectation, as a statistical average. Uh, so you have a statistical average of E log, again, times some OK. And this OK uh, is uh, the gradient of the, uh, is the, der the, the log derivative of our ANSATS or neural network. So I told you that we can compute the derivative of a neural network efficiently. Here I'm just taking the product and I'm averaging. So again, those are statistical averages. So I'm not doing the whole sum over the Hilbert space. So this, in theory, is the sum over sigma, p of sigma, e log of sigma, ok, w of sigma. But I'm not doing the whole sum. I'm just sampling sigma once and then taking the statistical average over this small, finite, polynomially large subset of, of, of basis elements. This means, however, that the gradient that I have estimated is not exact. It's not the exact gradient like what I had written here. Instead, it's, it's a noisy estimate. So I have the expectation value, but in my let's say equation of motion, the equation that I use to update uh, my parameters, I have to keep track of a random term. Let's say, let, let's assume that the error is distributed uh, as a Gaussian with a normal distribution. Then, then, then the error I know goes down as the, uh, like the variance goes down as one over the number of samples I've taken, right? So if I take infinitely many samples, this, this error goes down to zero. There is no noise, the equation is exact. But if the number of samples is finite, this is not true. And this is actually very interesting because um, this really starts to look like the, um, the Langevin, uh, Langevin process. So basically the uh, equation governing, like the approximate equation governing the motion of a particle in a potential well, like the potential well is determined by this, and for us, basically, it corresponds to our energy uh, functional. While the noise term for a, for a particle, for a, for a Langevin process, depends on the temperature of the medium where this particle is. So while in physical terms, we, this would be a temperature, for us, this temperature is, is essentially set by the number of samples, like they're inversely proportional. So if you think about it, if I take an infinite number of samples, my temperature is zero. So I, I do this optimization, this motion is exact. Instead, if I have a finite number of samples, I would be at a finite temperature. And this is very interesting, no? I, imagine that the potential we are trying to optimize is something like that. So I do my optimization. Uh, so this is energy 
and this is whatever parameter we have. So imagine I do my optimization and I fall down in this local, uh, local minima. If I'm here, uh, in principle, if my gradient is exact, this is a local minima, the gradient is zero, I cannot get out of it. But since I take a finite number of samples, I have a finite temperature. So there is a certain probability by which I will get out of this well and continue my optimization and eventually fall down in hopefully the global minima. So this is what happens uh, when you don't do a gradient descent, but you do a stochastic gradient descent or an approximate gradient descent. And this is one case where doing these things like approximately like actually helps us because it helps us not fall and not stay inside of local minima. Then there are other problems. Usually there are big regions where the gradient is almost zero. So it's very hard to optimize in those regions, but still let's say local minima are less of an issue. Especially if at the beginning of your optimization, you, you keep a number of, uh, of samples that is not too high in order to exactly for this, in order to avoid falling in local minima and then you can increase this number. So with that, I hope that I convinced you that we can find the ground state uh, by recasting the problem of finding the ground state into an optimization problem. Another interesting problem is time evolution, right? Also because if you can perform time evolution, I mean, I give you a state, you are able to compute the state at every at succe at successive, time, successive times, given an Hamiltonian. You can think also of performing some sort of imaginary time evolution where, uh, uh, where instead of uh, evolving in real time, you evolve in imaginary time, which you know will allow you to converge exponentially fast towards the ground state. So to do this, uh, we just catch the way we do it. Um, imagine you have a state given a parameter. So let's say this is a, an interesting state and you want, uh, you want to evolve it. Um, what, what we are trying to do essentially is you want, we know how to do the evolution, at least uh, how to analytically write it. Now it will be e to the minus i h delta t psi of w. And we want to find a state psi of w plus delta w, where delta w is some update of my parameters that is able to approximate my unitary time evolution. So the way we do this is we use linear approximations. So if we assume that the time steps are small enough, we can linearize the, the exponential, so the unitary operator, and we can write it down this way. At the same time, this uh, right-hand side, uh, this psi w plus delta w, we can expand it to first order in Taylor around w. So we can see the linear effect of changing the parameters. So what we get is basically, again, cw, of course, because we are expanding around this point. And then we find, uh, we apply all the log derivatives. Basically those are, uh, yeah, those OKs are, um, the in the WK uh, log psi W K. Uh, basically, there is a sigma also. Sigma, sigma. We have a sum of sigma. Um, so now what I want to do is I want to match those two, right? So the way we, we match, essentially, we try to find the set of the W that solve this approximate requirement is that we try to, uh, we define some overlap. Um, this is the overlap between the two states. It's also uh, the Fubini's to the metric. Um, and we try to minimize the distance between those two states. So we'll not do the full calculation because it takes a bit, but essentially, um, you can actually find the solution to it. So you can find that the solution to the de delta w, the updates that solve it, is given by this um, equation. So basically, I have an S matrix here as k, k prime on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, I have the same gradient that I had showed you before the gradient of the energy. So this S k, k prime is known as a quantum geometric tensor. It has the structure of this expectation value or statistical average of the log derivatives. It was in the context of uh, variational Monte Carlo, it was uh, first proposed by Sandro Sorella um, in the context of imaginary time evolution, where uh, he showed that this, uh, this object gives you 
it's essentially able to generate the imaginary time evolution. You would just get rid of this i. What is interesting is also that this quantum geometric tensor, um, essentially, it's a, it, it carries information about the, the metric of, this, of, our, of our ansatz. So essentially, uh, imagine, so you know very well that the, the space where our parameters live, our w parameters live, imagine I have a configuration w and I take another state w prime, which is equal to w plus delta w, and they are very close to each other. So the distance between those two states in this space, which has an Euclidean uh, metric, will be just uh, the, the norm of delta w, right? However, what we are really interested in is the Hilbert space. And my neural network, actually, what it does is that it takes a configuration and gives me a psi of w, right? And, and it is possible, since the mapping is highly nonlinear, neural networks are highly nonlinear function, it is entirely possible that this state, which is very close to, to the initial state in the space of the parameters, actually is very far in the space, in the Hilbert space, in the space of functions. So what the quantum geometric tensor does is it tries to estimate, it's a uh, first order estimation of the distance between the wave functions parameterized by w and w plus delta w. So it carries this sort of information. In any way, what, what, what we can do is essentially we can recast at least symbolically this equation and we can solve it. Uh, however, solving it means that we have to invert S. S is a matrix. You can show that uh, uh, S has a positive spectrum. So I, the eigenvalues of S, K, K prime are in R and are uh, bigger than zero. However, it is also a, often a highly singular function. So it's not easy to invert it. In any case, if you can invert it, usually we use, um, we try not to invert it and instead solve this linear problem with uh, some iterative optimization algorithm, such as uh, conjugate gradients, mean res, and several others. In any case, if you can solve it and you can determine this set of parameters, the w that solve it, you just feed them back into the uh, equation that we use to update uh, the weights and then Essentially, at every iteration, instead of computing just the gradient, you compute the gradient, you can compute the geometric ten the quantum geometric tensor, you solve a linear system, and then you use the output to, uh, to update your weights. And you do this on and on. And, and this can be used to perform the time evolution of the system, the imaginary time evolution of, uh, of your system in order to find the ground state more efficiently, and so on and so forth. So with that, I conclude. Um, essentially, I, the, the, I, I, just to sum up a bit, I, shown, I have shown you that we can use neural, neural networks uh, to variationally encode a quantum, an arbitrary quantum state, or at least a physically relevant quantum state. We can estimate expectation values efficiently by doing Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. We can also compute the gradient of those expectation values, and in particular of the energy efficiently so that we can optimize it. I've shown you that we can recast the uh, problem of finding the ground state and also the problem of doing the time evolution into some sort of optimization problem, thanks to the variational principle. And uh, this allows us to solve them with iterative methods. And uh, uh, to end, I would like to point out that if you're interested in all of those things, we have a Python package uh, that we are developing, which is called NetCat. Uh, you can find it at netcat.org web address, where we implement most of those uh, methods. Uh, there are several tutorials that teach you how to do it. It's very easy to use. Uh, usually, you just need to define your Hamiltonian, the variational ansatz of a neural network you wish to use, and then the technique you want to use to optimize for the ground state or the time evolution and these kind of things. So yeah, with that, I'm done. Uh, I think there are, I don't know how much time I have. I will try to answer some questions. Maybe, maybe you can address a few questions. There were a couple of them that arrived uh, regarding the second part of the lecture there in the end of the, actually three of them now. Um, so do, do you see a question and answer box? Yeah, just give me a moment. 
Uh, so you have mentioned that uh, um, can we use the stochastic gradient descent to find the saddle point of, a ener of an energy landscape? Um, so in general, we do like, I mean, stochastic gradient descent will go down. So in general, we, it will not stop at a saddle point and it's not so easy to say if you are at a saddle point or not. Um, usually saddle points are something you want to avoid because they slow down the optimization unless you are uh, you use good optimizers, but it's a problem. But in general, no, we are like we are trying to find the ground state. But I would also like to say that um, I mean, but yes, like this energy function that we are optimizing is yeah, it's an energy function that depends on defined on the space of the variational parameters, but uh, a saddle point in this space uh, doesn't really uh, doesn't really mean that your your the system that you're describing had I mean the, the saddle point in this in this energy functional does not really mean but doesn't really have a physical meaning. So is it is there a way to estimate if a subspace W we consider contains or at least is close enough to the real ground state? Um, yes. So I guess the subspace of the Hilbert space, with subspace W, you actually mean the subspace of the Hilbert space that our ansatz, uh, our variational ansatz is describing, uh, not the variational manifold, which is just uh, like some tool we are using. Um, so, First of all, the lower the energy that we can estimate, uh, the better the approximation it is. This is already an indication. Uh, so if we want to benchmark against other techniques, uh, this is very useful. But if when we are going into the realms of uh, unexplored realms, for example, two or three dimensional systems where there are fewer results, for example, what we can do is, uh, um, I didn't talk about it, but we can, so let me see. Yes. So when we estimate ELOC, uh, ELOC is, yeah, here I have uh, the, the definition. Um, so ELOC of sigma, if, if, my, if my wave function psi w is the ground state is exactly the ground state. Then I expect that when it is easy to prove that uh, E log all for any possible input sigma, they are all the same and they are like E ground state. So essentially, the variance of this distribution and therefore you, the error by uh, your, error, your statistical error in your estimate will go down to zero. This is called the zero variance principle. And, and therefore, it's, uh, it's quite easy to see that you reached. Like this is actually not true only for the ground state, but for any eigen state of the Hamiltonian. But since in general we are looking for the ground state, um, unless there is something very pathological, if you hit this condition, you know that you are really at the ground state. You we can also use this technique and with some tricks based on symmetries to actually target excited states. Yeah. Um, are there particular classes of Hamiltonians that can or can't be calculated using the neural quantum technique? Um, so in general, there are Hamiltonians that are harder to train for, but in general, we have two tools essentially. No, you, you give me given an Hamiltonian that we try to uh, for which we try to find the ground state. We we first we can try to cook up a good uh, neural network that should be able to represent the ground state. Of course, if I know that the ground state should respect some symmetries or uh, must represent fermions or uh, bosons or whatever, I will change the architecture. I will not always use the same architecture. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, like, this already changes the tool I'm using to, to solve the problem. In, in general, I'm not aware of any particular uh, Hamiltonian that, like there are some Hamiltonians that are for which it's harder to solve the optimization problem, but it's also related to the ansatz. Uh, we are still trying to completely understand 
what makes the optimization procedure hard. So let's say this is still a, an open research question to know exactly what is preventing us from uh, solving the optimization problem, if it's the ansatz we are choosing, or if it's the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Um, can we extend those finite temperature calculation? Can we extend this to finite temperature calculation of expectation values? Yes, indeed we can. Uh, we can also extend it to determine the steady state or the time evolution of an open quantum system or dissipative systems. Um, it's not particularly hard, but uh, in just 45 minutes, it's hard to talk about all those uh, generalization of this technique. Um, can you comment a little bit more on why the neural network variational ansatz is better than other kind of ansatzes? Is it related to nonlinearity? So I'm not saying that neural networks are necessarily better than other, uh, than other ansatzes. This is still a question we are, we are researching on. So for example, in one dimensional, uh, for one dimensional system, we know that uh, matrix product states are extremely efficient and would be very hard to beat. And the optimization is also not, uh, it's also quite simple. Um, for uh, two or three or four dimensional systems already like variational ansatzes and neural network are uh, quite, uh, I mean, they're very general and, and therefore they can, they can work very well. And also we can take uh, years of research done by the giants in machine learning such as Google and IBM and several others and exploit them to because we have interesting structures that allow, allow us to address uh, some some problems and actually uh, encode in our in our in our architecture some some symmetries of the system. So in general, neural there are theorems that tells us that neural networks um, are able to capture um, arbitrary correlations. So even volume law entanglement in in a system. Uh, which is something, for example, that in 2D MPS cannot do. It's very hard to, I mean, we are still trying to understand exactly the limits of those techniques, but uh, there are theorems that tells us that the neural networks are arbitrary, very good function approximators. So it's, uh, it's a, I mean, they, they perform very well. And uh, I'm not saying that it's the ultimate technique. Okay, I think now it's Maybe time to, to stop. Okay. Take a break. I don't know if you, there are a couple of more questions. I think, I, I don't know if you want to answer them maybe by typing in, but I think we should take a break now. So we are back at uh, 1.45. So in 10 minutes, we start the, the lecture by look at the lab. Okay. Filippo, so is it fine? You can check the, uh, the questions and maybe you can answer them directly. Yeah, okay. I'll just write down the answer or Yeah, yeah, there is there is a possibility so you can after yeah. break or I mean I can go on answering uh, I don't know as you want. I don't I don't Okay, uh, for me it's fine just I don't know whether other my hope participants are fine for it. So if you prefer to answer them like that or if you think you can quickly answer right. yeah, let's go and then then we break and then we stop afterwards. However, we would like to start at the no, so, okay, so let's just stop now and uh, Giuseppe will give his talk and okay. okay. Okay, good. So we are back in 10 minutes here. Thanks everyone. See you soon.